This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. We fight the woke in the legislatures. We fight the woke in the schools. We fight the woke in the corporations. We refuse to surrender to the woke mob. This state is where woke goes to die. Or maybe not. Despite what Governor Ron DeSantis says over and over, actually, the courts in Florida are where his anti-woke laws go to die. Many of his most controversial laws and his declared war on woke have faced legal roadblocks. The latest is his ban on so-called woke company training, which restricts how private employers can train their workers. The conservative 11th Circuit Court of Appeals unanimously blocked that ban as unconstitutional for committing, quote, the greatest First Amendment sin, penalizing speech based on viewpoints. Joining me is First Amendment law expert Eugene Volokh, a professor at UCLA Law School. Eugene, can you tell us what this particular anti-woke law is about? Sure. So this case involves a particular portion of the Florida law that's called uh, sometimes the Stop Woke Act. It doesn't deal with other portions having to do, for example, with colleges and universities and the like. It has to do with its restriction on employers, including private employers. And that restriction prohibits employers from subjecting people as condition of employment to training, instruction, or other such activities, required activities, that, among other things, promote a certain set of beliefs. And those beliefs include things like members of one race, color, sex, or national origin are morally superior to others. Or a person by virtue of his race or national origin is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. Or that a person's moral character or status as privileged or oppressed is necessarily determined by race, color, sex, and the like. So there are certain particular viewpoints that uh, private employers are not allowed to include or to teach as part of compelled instruction for their employees. What I'm confused about, I mean, is there any private employer teaching that one race is superior to the other or any of the other things? I'm not sure about the superior, but my understanding, and I I don't know the exact details, but my understanding is that some supposed diversity, equity, and inclusion instruction does talk about how well, you know, white people are privileged, whereas non-whites or especially blacks are oppressed, or that uh, whites are inherently racist and that whites should be viewed as as oppressors. There are other things the law also includes, uh, like that members of a particular group cannot and should not attempt to treat others without respect to race, color, sex, or national origin. My understanding is that some forms of instruction do indeed say, look, it's impossible for us to be colorblind either in general or it's impossible for whites to be colorblind. Another item that's covered by the law is that they can't teach that a person bears responsibility for or should be discriminated against because of actions committed in the past by other members of the same race, sex, national origin, and the like. Well, there too, I think some trainings do suggest that a a race-based affirmative action is justified because whites in the past have oppressed blacks, uh, let's say, and therefore there needs to be uh, compensatory preferential treatment and discrimination now because of that. The opponents of the law sued over its effects on free speech, so basically just saying it was a free speech violation. Yes, that's right. And in particular, they said, look, this law is viewpoint based. It doesn't just, for example, prohibit employers from having mandatory uh, education sessions that talk about politics of, of any sort. Rather, it singles out particular viewpoints as being prohibited in these kinds of education programs. And the court says that viewpoint discrimination is the hardest to justify, most likely unconstitutional form of speech restriction, and that the law indeed unconstitutionally discriminated based on viewpoint, and the 11th Circuit panel agreed. Florida argued that it was regulating employers' conduct, not speech, and the court said, we reject this latest attempt to control speech by recharacterizing it as conduct. Does that happen often as a defense in these cases, saying it's conduct? Yeah, I think the government uh, often tries to do this. Sometimes, for example, laws that ban sexual orientation change therapy uh, for children 
have been justified as bans on conduct, even when the therapy involved only uh, basically speaking to the person rather than administering drugs and the like. Likewise, some other laws that ban supposed cyber stalking, but cyber stalking in the form of unwanted speech about a person. There sometimes are such laws or injunctions that say, look, stop talking about this person have been justified as restrictions on conduct. But the court here says that that's not going to fly because the only conduct here is conveying certain viewpoints. If, for example, the law said, well, you can't require people to be at work before 8 a.m., let's say. Well, okay, that would not be a speech restriction. That would be a conduct restriction. Various kinds of laws regulating the employment relationship are conduct restrictions. But where the law says, look, these are particular ideas, particular opinions you cannot teach people. Well, that's all about the speech, all about what uh, the employer is communicating, and therefore it's a speech restriction. Did anything in particular in the opinion stand out to you? I think it was a pretty forceful repudiation of this kind of viewpoint discrimination. I will say there was one thing in particular that might be relevant also for future cases. One thing that Florida said in defense of the law is said, look, there are all, all of these rulings about hostile work environments, and supposed racial harassment, where employers can be held liable for racially offensive or sexually or religiously offensive speech, even by their employees and especially by the employer itself. So uh, there have been lawsuits, for example, over uh, people playing offensive and supposedly misogynistic, uh, perhaps even actually misogynistic rap lyrics, or claims that it was racial harassment for people to say things that are potentially racist, even if they're kind of political expression. So Florida's argument was, look, it's established that it's okay to restrict that kind of speech. Well, we want to restrict speech that may create a racially hostile environment through these forms of kind of mandatory training. And the court said, well, you know, Title VII is different. That's a part of this broader anti-discrimination law. But beyond that, even Title VII, even these kind of racial harassment and sexual harassment principles, there are valid concerns about how they collide with the First Amendment. And that courts, therefore, must exercise special caution when applying Title VII to matters involving traditionally protected areas of speech. So I do think that might be helpful for the future when it's sort of anti-woke or non-woke speech that leads to a lawsuit. This may well be cited as to say that, well, you know, that is protected by the First Amendment and the government can't impose liability for it. So did they use a strict scrutiny standard? Right. So the court said, look, this is content discrimination, but even worse, it's viewpoint discrimination. Uh, viewpoint discrimination is generally unconstitutional. You know, maybe it might be constitutional if it passes this exacting standard of strict scrutiny. But it is rare that a regulation restricting speech, even because of its content, much less its viewpoint, will ever be permissible, the court was saying. And the court said in this case, you know, it doesn't pass strict scrutiny. There's no compelling government interest in suppressing this kind of speech. The press secretary for DeSantis said they're reviewing all options for a potential appeal. One of those options would be the Supreme Court. Do you think the Supreme Court would want to weigh in on a case like this? You know, it's possible. Supreme Court does take a considerable number of First Amendment cases because it thinks that First Amendment rules are particularly important. I think it's pretty unlikely just because even in cases where a state challenges a finding that a law was unconstitutional, the court usually prefers to wait until there's a split of authority in lower courts, a circuit split where, say, the 11th Circuit strikes down some law and, say, the 8th Circuit upholds a similar law or uses some legal analysis that's inconsistent with the 11th Circuit's decision. That's sort of a signal to the court that this is an important issue. It's likely to recur. Lower courts are in disagreement. Usually when there's kind of a one-off state law, uh, in which there aren't really a lot of others like it, and certainly no appellate decisions dealing with it. When that gets struck down, that usually doesn't lead to Supreme Court review, but it's possible. Um, so now, why is the state appealing the injunction of the university restrictions separately? Well, so like many uh, statutes, this is, again, what's colloquially called the Stop Woke Act, involves several very different kinds of restrictions. They have a common theme. But just because they're in the same statute doesn't mean they really can effectively be challenged even in the same lawsuit. So this this lawsuit, for example, was brought by an employer which said, look, you're restricting our speech. But the employer doesn't have standing to challenge the restriction on uh, public university professor's speech. 
Conversely, the public university professors are challenging the university portion of the law, but they don't have standing uh, to challenge the law that applies to private employers' mandatory education programs. The important point is this is a law that has several provisions in it. The provisions are severable from each other in the sense that they could be struck down or upheld individually. A particular lawsuit is brought by people usually who are affected by one provision or another, and the judge in that case can only deal with the particular provisions that are being challenged there. I mean, how big a victory is this for free speech coming from a conservative appellate court? Noteworthy? Yeah, it is noteworthy because it's a reminder that First Amendment provides very strong protection against viewpoint discrimination by the government. And that applies, again, whether it's discrimination against woke viewpoints or against anti-woke viewpoints. That generally speaking, the government cannot restrict speech, faith, and viewpoint, even when the viewpoints have to do with highly controversial matters such as race and sex and national origin, and even when the viewpoints are offensive to many. Thanks so much for your insights, Eugene, as always. That's Professor Eugene Volokh of UCLA Law School. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, the lawyers who sued over Elon Musk's excessive $56 billion pay package now want $6 billion in Tesla stock as legal fees. And later in the show, Elon Musk sues OpenAI, and it fights back with some of his own emails. Remember, you can always get the latest in legal news by listening to our Bloomberg Law podcast. You can find them on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. And attorneys, Looking for legal research? Whether you're an in-house counsel or in private practice, Bloomberg Law gives you the edge with the latest in AI-powered legal analytics, business insights, and workflow tools. With guidance from our experts, you'll grasp the latest trends in the legal industry, helping you achieve better results. For the practice of law, the business of law, the future of law, visit BloombergLaw.com. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. $6 billion in legal fees. That's how much the lawyers who argued that Elon Musk's $56 billion pay package was excessive are asking for their efforts. Oh, and they'll take those fees in Tesla stock, please. Even more astounding, that unprecedented $6 billion fee may be allowable under Delaware law. Joining me is business law expert Eric Talley, a professor at Columbia Law School. Six billion dollars in legal fees. That would be an hourly rate of two hundred eighty-eight thousand eight hundred eighty-eight dollars. I mean, where are they getting that from? Well, once again, June, you and I have chosen the wrong professions, it appears. <laughs> but uh, so <clears throat> here's is it too late? I, I don't know. It's never too late. One can always dream. But here's where they're getting it from. First of all, realize that. The outcome of the case was phenomenally large as well, right? $56 billion, you know, in in terms of a compensation package that is essentially then being clawed back. And so the way that this case gets set up, as well as pretty much all shareholder litigation, is that it is brought on a contingency fee basis, which means that the lawyers are going to basically self finance the entire action until they get to the finish line of either a settlement or, in this case, a judgment, an outcome. And only then are they in a position where they can try to petition the court for an award of attorney's fees. And so essentially, you could almost think of the law firms that bring these actions as almost being like venture capital funds, right? They invest in a bunch of different projects, of different lawsuits. Many of them are going to be losers. Many of them are going to either settle for nothing or they'll just have to be dropped. And then other ones will pay off. So it's a kind of a high risk, high reward thing. And so it is often the case that when there is one of these cases that ends up resulting in a substantial judgment that can be monetized, and this one is one, the contingency fee it looks in hindsight like an outrageous amount of hourly compensation. But one also has to think about how to set that off against a bunch of other factors, including risk, including cost, including effort including the hard aspects of bringing a a case of of this type of complexity. And so when you sort of back those out, most of the time, these contingency fees end up looking a little bit smaller on an hourly uh, basis because you've essentially had to control for all the high probabilities that there was going to be nothing at the end of the rainbow here. So that's one of the factors that really controls 
you know, any situation where there's a contingency fee award when it's not structured as an hourly rate, pretty much all of these plaintiff shareholder litigation fees are based on some type of a contingency arrangement. And how have the Delaware courts been viewing these contingency fees in stockholder actions? Over the years, the courts have come up with sort of a formula for thinking about when and under what circumstances a contingency fee should be awarded and how high it should be, what percentage of the total award should be paid over to the attorneys. And there, the Delaware courts have, you know, there's a longstanding line of cases, and they're actually pretty current. They go back a long time, but the most recent ones are within the last couple of years. They basically say, look, there's several factors that we look at. One of the factors we look at is, you know, the value that is created for shareholders. And, you know, I guess one lens of this, you could say, well, this was $56 billion worth of value that was created to shareholders because those Tesla shareholders were able to claw back a $56 billion, you know, stock award payment that they would have had to share. And now they don't have to share it anymore. A couple of the other factors that go into it is, uh, you know, how risky was it? How costly was it? What's the reputation of the firms that are bringing this? Are they kind of ambulance chaser type firms? Are they sophisticated sort of firms? The thing that was kind of odd about this case is that when you went down these factors, the factors all seemed to point in the plaintiff's direction, right? This was a you know fairly substantial award. It was risky. It was costly. Bernstein Litowitz, who was lead counsel on this, is you know one of probably the most sophisticated and you know high reputation plaintiff firms in the country. And so typically what that would mean is that when you get to the end of these factors, which the petition for fees went through them one by one, if you check all the boxes, make it to the very finish line, then the typical norm in Delaware is to award something like 33% like a third of Whoa. the award to the attorneys. Now that would have been about you know, that would have been about eighteen billion dollars. And so I think that the attorneys when they were drafting this sort of said, okay, that's just a big number. And so they kind of make a point of saying, look, we're gonna articulate all these factors. We're gonna say that that under existing law would entitle us to a third. We're gonna take a third of a third or eleven percent. And that's where they ended up at their five point eight or five point nine billion dollar request. But Does it not seem ironic that they argued that Musk's pay package was excessive and now they want a chunk of it, also excessive? Yeah, it's kind of an interesting thing. I mean, I guess you could run this in in multiple directions, right? One is to say the pay package was so excessive that when we prevailed, this is what the plaintiff's attorneys would argue, that when we prevailed on having it nullified, we created an excessive benefit to shareholders. And we can point to that benefit, that $56 billion benefit that inured to the non-Elon Musk shareholders. So had the pay package not been as exorbitant, then our fee would not be as large. And we are then once again doubling back and saying, and guess what? We're going to take only a third of the fee that under the sort of the cookie cutter approach we would presumptively be entitled to. The fact of the matter, though, is you're right, June, that this is a gargantuan award. It's very, very large. A lot of times you'll see big fights over attorney's fees that are in the hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, $300, $400 million. Those are the ones that have generated the biggest fights over whether those fees should go through or whether they should be shaved down. But one of the big challenges in this case is that the $56 billion award is kind of the the denominator against which all this other stuff is measured, right? And we just haven't seen a $56 billion award that has put itself in this position where we're trying to figure out what's the value of the attorney's fees. And, you know, there are cases recently that have tried to contend with this question of, you know, as the award gets bigger, should the percentage go down? And uh, the Delaware courts have generally resisted that thus far, but that could be a factor that factors into Chancellor McCormick's assessment of the fee request. But Elon Musk may not be getting that $56 billion pay package, but they have to redo his pay package, right? So Tesla won't be keeping all of that $56 billion. Well, that, I think, really is the $56 billion question, June. The the pay package itself was nullified, which basically means that Mr. Musk was working 
maybe not quite for free because remember he owned 22 percent of the company so any you know 10 billion dollar increase in the value of the company is you know going to give him two billion dollars worth of value that he has already pocketed but one of the things that i think is is one area where you know one, one could sort of kick this case around and try to think you know what where are the ways that it might have come out differently i think one area that it might have come out differently is exactly on this point about whether if the pay package is being nullified does that mean that he's entitled to nothing for the services that he provided to Tesla over these years under the presumption that he was going to be paid from this executive compensation package? And so that it itself is a type of a claim that you will often see in cases where a contract gets nullified. It said, look, if you're not going to let me collect pursuant to the contract, let me at least make out a claim of what was the benefit that I conferred on the other side, and we can come up with fair terms. And so th that argument, for example, might end up culminating in a finding that the fair value of what Musk created for Tesla was, you know, $30 billion or, or something like that. And so that would then be kind of an offset that you often will see in, in contract cases at the end. This case was a little odd because, you know, a lot of the, the litigation gets compressed a short amount of time, and people have to argue about all the different parts of the case. And so the Tesla attorneys in this case, Mr. Musk's attorneys in this case, were sort of in an odd position of sort of saying, hey, listen, this pay package is 100% fair. You know, it was highly incentivized, but that was exactly what the design was. And look how well it paid off. It would be hard to, at the same time to say, oh, by the way, this was the fair and the unfair part, right? It's kind of hard to, to, mm -hmm. to argue that the thing was entirely fair. And at the same time, you can distinguish between the fair part and the unfair part. And so I, I think the defense attorneys in this case uh, sort of understandably decided to make a strategic choice of not even offering, you know, some alternative valuation that's less than $56 billion of what the fair value of Mr. Musk's services was. But that ended up, you know, creating big problems for them once liability was found, because there was no alternative theory about what some sort of an offset should be for the, for the fair value of Musk's services. So, you know, it's conceivable that the Supreme Court of Delaware, if this goes up on appeal to the Supreme Court, which I suspect it will, will say, hey, 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 no, no, we want to send this back because we want to hear a trial on this. It's called restitution, right? This restitution theory. It's a possibility. And realize that that bears on these factors. One of the factors is how much value that you did you create for stockholders? Well, right now we're sitting at $56 billion worth of value that got created to stockholders. But if, say, half of that is going to be carved off and offset because of a, I don't know, a restitutionary claim, then maybe it's only $28 billion that you created for stockholders or, may, or maybe even less. And so we don't really know the answer to that question. Or the answer to that question as of now is there is no restitutionary offset. And will there definitely be a restitutionary process? This whole idea of sort of saying, okay, we're not going to enforce the contract, but we'll let you make a claim for your restitution of uh, whatever benefits you did confer, that's a highly judgment-oriented uh, determination. It is really left up to the discretion of the judge. And there is, at least historically, some, some precedent out there for judges saying, hey, hey, hey I'm willing to let this you know, go forward and let you make your arguments about, you know, your your restitutionary interest. But I won't do it if you have unclean hands, if you have been a naughty actor before. And and if you read the front, you know, 180 pages of Chancellor McCormick's opinion, you know, one could read that as saying Elon Musk and the board members were naughty actors. So I'm not going to afford them now the chance for a mulligan, essentially, to try to claim what their restitutionary interest is. Now, there are cases that go both ways. And so, you know, I think that's a little bit more of, you know, issue of law that one could imagine the Delaware Supreme Court disagreeing on. But if that were to happen, if there were some sort of an offset to the $56 billion that's been returned to Tesla stockholders, and Musk is able to claw back some fraction of that in restitution, that's going to you know, cause the benefit to the stockholders to go much further down. That, in principle, then would have an effect on the dollar value of the percentage that the plaintiff's attorneys are trying to ask for. It is unusual, is it not, for the legal team is seeking to be paid by taking part of what Musk is giving up, so Tesla stock? 
It is definitely an unconventional request. It was not surprising to me that they made a request of, of Tesla stock rather than money, in part because that is the very remedy that they were seeking. You know, they were seeking the return of stock. And if you then want to translate that into what is 11% of the value of that, well, then you get another set of headaches about how do you, on what date do you value it? And how do you value some of these, you know, options that haven't been fully vested yet and, and, you know, maybe underwater or, or at the money or, you know, in the money and so forth. So that ends up setting up a, a huge number of valuation challenges that I think on some level the plaintiff said, you know, look, we don't have to go there on the valuation challenges. If we had petitioned for the return of money, then we'd want 11% of the money. We petitioned for the return of a bunch of shares. We want 11% of the shares. Now, on some level, that makes sense. I think it might also make sense from the you know, business positioning right now of Tesla. It's still a very, very valuable company, obviously. But, you know, the headwinds in the EV industry are now, you know, definitely strong. And so, you know, having the corporate um, sort of till invaded by a, a cash award that has to go out to plaintiff's attorneys, that's a little bit harder still. You know, Tesla could, in principle, just sell more stock and pay for it that way. But, um, you know, on some level, even though it's unconventional, it just didn't surprise me to see that the, the request was being made for stock which was the very thing that the the plaintiffs were asking for the return of rather than cash. Now, it does put kind of an interesting twist on what do you do if you were a plaintiff side firm who just has received a bunch of stock in a defendant that you just sued and you're trying to, you know, maybe like build more business in the future and some of that business might be now suing that same company for other things in the future. Well, now you're a big stockholder of that company. <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you really want to win? Because now it's going to hurt you in the pocketbook <laughs> with respect to the stock that you own. So my sense is that even, you know, if an award of stock is approved and is uh, effectively executed on, the plaintiff's attorneys are probably going to be um, well advised to try to, to unwind that position through sort of progressive sales of those stocks out into the market. So they are no longer basically, you know, big stockholders of the of the company that they may end up suing again, you know, possibly for how the company responds to this very judgment. Stay with me, Eric. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, I'll continue this conversation with Columbia Law School professor Eric Talley. And we're going to be talking about another lawsuit, this one brought by Musk against OpenAI. The lawsuit's kind of iffy, and OpenAI is fighting back with some of Musk's own emails. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. There is some chance that above zero that AI will kill us all. I think it's low, but there's some chance. What do you, what's your first take on this lawsuit? Elon Musk has always been among the most outspoken about the dangers of AI. And now he's suing OpenAI and its CEO, Sam Altman, alleging they violated the artificial intelligence startup's founding mission by putting profit ahead of benefiting humanity. I've been talking to Professor Eric Talley of Columbia Law School. Eric, Musk is apparently suing for humanity, for breach of contract, breach of fiduciary duty, and claims of unfair business practices. What's your first take on this lawsuit? It's very creative, June. It's a very creative lawsuit, possibly so creative that it's hard to find law to back it up. <laughs> so here's, <laughs> here's part of the problem. And, you know, I teach contracts as well. And the key ingredients to a breach of contract suit is you have to have a contract with the other side. The other side then has to have breached the contract. And then you have to be able to show damages. And if any of those fail, you don't have a lawsuit. And there's an argument that Maybe all three are very dodgy here, or at least two of the three are very dodgy here. So the first is like, is there a contract? Well, you know, in the complaint that was filed by Mr. Musk, there certainly doesn't seem to be any document that says, here is the investment agreement and here's the promises that OpenAI are making. You know, but the exhibits that were attached to the agreement that are supposed to, you know, memorialize the existence of the contract were like a, a bunch of text message or email exchanges that you know seemed very preliminary and a little bit 
slapdash and informal, followed by basically a reproduction of the charter of open AI, which does have a purpose provision. And, you know, there is a set of uh, interpretations, uh, legal interpretations of this, that the charter of a company is in some ways like a contract between the stockholders and the company itself. But that's going to have to carry a heavy load here because those preliminary email exchanges, that's kind of classic example of a non-contract, right? That kind of preliminary language just isn't filled out enough to put any specificity on what the underlying contract, if there is one, looks like. Second thing is, if there was a contract, who would enforce that contract? Is this a contract that is, you know, that is enforceable by one of the people that, that basically paid money to a nonprofit so they weren't getting like stock stock or anything, right? Nonprofits don't have stockholders. Um, so would it be sort of humanity that if anyone has a cause of action here, it should be humanity versus <laughs> oh open goodness. AI. And, and Elon Musk is you know, now sort of appointing himself as a, a representative of humanity, I guess. But you know, I think he's got to c- turn this into, no, this was a contract with me for me to give you money under the expectation that you weren't going to go out and, I don't know, do profitable things with it. And so so it's really hard to determine, even if there is a contract, whether he's got standing to sue. If he does, how do we know that OpenAI hasn't done stuff for the good of humanity, right? The fact of the matter is, yes, when you were out there as a nonprofit, per se, you probably have to engage in various types of transactions and, and, and um, relationships with other players who are not nonprofit. And that happens all the time, right? And so if, if I agree to you know, invest money in your nonprofit that's supposed to feed the homeless in Central Park, I don't really have a, a, a complaint when you decide to buy you know, food from McDonald's, which is a for-profit company, in order to, to execute on that. And so there is a sort of a sense in which it's not even clear that you know, dealing with companies like Microsoft is necessarily inconsistent with what that mission is. Because the mission that's in the charter is actually crafted pretty broadly to give a lot of discretion on what to do. And then, you know, OpenAI has recently posted a blog post that basically said that Musk himself was kind of needling them throughout before he departed the company to try to get them to move in a more monetized direction, including a potential merger with Tesla that he was pushing. So there's almost a sense in which his own words are, you know, likely to be used against him as to whether anyone really understood this to be the type of contractual obligation to be sort of the Mother Teresa of data that it doesn't look like he even believed so long as, you know, there was a chance that Tesla might be able to acquire OpenAI. So to put it in legal terms, the lawsuit is iffy. And also, I mean, you have the fact that he has founded his own AI startup, X, of course, he loves the X, XAI, and that's a for-profit entity. I don't know where that fits in, just as another irony, perhaps. Yeah, it probably does fit in as like sort of additional evidence that Mr. Musk himself sort of had the big use case view of generative AI as being part of a profit generating enterprise that also coincidentally and simultaneously would be creating benefits for humanity. And those things are not always inconsistent with one another. But it, it does sort of suggest that his mindset Throughout this period of time, including you know what he's doing now, seems to be very much a mindset of use, harnessing these tools for purposes of generating net revenues. And so to then sort of file this lawsuit against OpenAI for doing exactly that, it's somewhat reminiscent of Casablanca character, Captain Renault, who you know proclaims that he is shocked, shocked <laughs> that there's gambling going on in this establishment. Right? It's, it just seems unlikely to be the case. Now, you know if OpenAI was formed as a nonprofit, so there's a little bit more grab to that to that argument. Sort of say, hey, no, no, I, you know, I formed X as a for-profit. You formed this as a nonprofit, so does that mean anything? And so, you know, it's not like there are no arguments, but boy, do you have to reach deep into the pocket to find the types of arguments that would conventionally go into a, a standard contract claim. And by the way, we haven't even gotten to damages, right? If, oh, the if, damages um, are crazy. Yeah. And who gets them, right? Does humanity get the damages? Apparently. <laughs> apparently, yeah. because OpenAI has to make its research and technology open to the public, 
prevent anyone, including Microsoft, which, by the way, has invested billions in open AI, from benefiting financially from its technology. And also the CEO, Altman, has to give up all the money he's earned. But, I mean, this is like drama, drama, drama. That boardroom drama where the company directors ousted Altman and then he was reinstated. There is a lot of drama. The, the dramas are not completely separate, right? A lot of times when you, you know, sort of, you know, thinking about the various things that Elon Musk does, does it's it's kind of like that they could be completely random you know sort of peripatetic things that he's up to but these are actually a little bit more connected because the earlier drama with open ai was a little bit about a kind of an existential crisis on exactly what the weight that the company was going to place on you know doing business with for-profit entities versus um, essentially just being a big basket of public goods and so uh, you know on some level one can view this lawsuit as kind of a reaction to the internal reaction in OpenAI when, you know, Altman was kind of unceremoniously shown the door because some board members sort of thought that the company had gone too far in the direction of commercialization. But then so much employee unrest and, and unrest generally um, ensued that, you know, caused him to basically come right back in and effectively having now won that internal skirmish Mr. Musk has now decided to turn it into an external skirmish. It's just not clear that he has standing to do so. And so it's just a just an odd situation. My, my guess is his best claim for damages is just the return of his $45 million, right, which is yet another kind of restitutionary claim that, that he can make. That's something you can at least quantify and it's stuff that, that he paid in. But even that, you know, was he paying it in under the, the assumption that there would never be any involvement by big players like Microsoft when you've got these emails from him at the time he's making the investment, the, the investment saying, you can't just do this with $100 million. You're going to need dollar denominations that start with a B, and you're going to need to get big players in to help you out here if you have any chance of competing against Google. Well, who are those big players are going to be? He suggested Tesla, but Microsoft is definitely another one. And so, you know, the optics of the lawsuit as well also raise at least the possibility that, you know, we have this person who is trying to, you know, make a mark um, now, I guess, using X to be a big player in generative AI. If you're trying to, you know, create some elbow room at that table, it's always good if you can elbow a couple of the big competitors in the face. And maybe that's part of what's going on here as well. It's like, you know, maybe this was, you know, deemed to be worth a shot because it would essentially, you know, recap Microsoft's ability to, to compete effectively in the generative AI space, leaving, you know, a, a smaller number of the FANG firm working on the same project and maybe creating a little bit more elbow room for Mr. Musk to scoot up to the generative AI table. Sounds a lot more realistic than benefiting humanity. I always enjoy our conversations, Eric. Thanks so much for taking the time. That's Professor Eric Talley of Columbia Law School. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg.